So welcome everybody to our October edition of Drink, the shorter online version. What I'm going to do is just give you a quick intro to um, a few things that have happened since we last met and we're doing this every month now towards the end of each month. So um, it's only been a month since we last uh, did this. So things that have changed or new things that have come along in the world of search uh, in the last uh, three or four weeks. And then I'm going to hand over to our speakers. First, up, we're going to have um, Richard and then uh, following Richard, we'll have Luke speaking as well. Um, I don't have a huge amount to say, not least because uh, I was going to do these slides this afternoon and I've been on calls with clients all afternoon. Um, so I've not actually had a drink since about two o'clock this afternoon. So apologies if I croak a bit as I'm doing this. Fortunately, Google have pretty much done my job for me anyway uh, by making lots of announcements at their search on live stream uh, last week. And uh, here we have a number of relevant announcements from them. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen this. I'm sure many of you will have read bits and bobs about it uh, on various blogs, Twitter, etc. Um, so BERT, which was used in about 10% of queries when it launched a year ago in the, uh, in the live algorithm, is now used in almost every query in English. Um, BERT, of course, being bidirectional encoders. Uh, oh, what's the R stand for? Something transformers. I can't remember it now. Uh, essentially, the AI algorithm uh, or machine learning algorithm, I should say, for uh, better understanding intent and particularly the transformers element of language, i.e. how words in a sentence or paragraph change the meaning of others, um, which is how machines better understand intent, of course, is now used in pretty much every search on Google in English. So um, quite significant there and uh, only underlines the importance of thinking about natural language processing when you're copywriting uh, and putting content together for the web. Uh, Google also says that they've launched a new way, uh, a deep neural net uh, AI way of understanding misspellings. Apparently, one in 10 queries on Google is misspelt. Um, and they say that this new way of handling misspellings um, is a, an improvement, makes more improvement, I should say, than all of the improvements they've made in the last five years together. So in their eyes, a big improvement in how they're handling misspellings. Um, and then they talked about something which is slightly confusing SEOs all over the world. Um, that they now will be ranking, or to use the words they used initially, indexing passages of text individually from pages. And the example they gave of that is um, the little screenshot you can see in the bottom left here. So um, th they're making the point here that rather than provide you with a page on that topic, what they're now doing is pulling out the specific bit of information from a page um, which really answers the query that you've typed in. Um, and uh, that's caused people to think that paragraphs of text are going to be indexed individually rather than whole pages. And because Google used the term indexed and uh, they've come out and clarified that. So no, we're ranking bits of text. No, it's not indexing. Pages are still indexed. Being indexed in the same as crawling. So there's a whole load of clarification been going on around this on social media. But um, essentially, the way that I look at that is uh, there's going to be more content put into the search results directly so that people don't need to click through to your site. So this is another in Google's many and long list of moves that will reduce organic traffic one way or another. Um, that said, it could also be an opportunity, but I think that's probably what's going to happen. So uh, what they've also talked about is uh, something which I think is definitely going to change the way search results are presented. And um, they are uh, going to be basically grouping stuff together uh, into different uh, bits of the search results when you make a reasonably broad search. So if I just get this to play again, their example is uh, a search for home exercise equipment. Obviously, there's all types of home exercise equipment. And so what they're showing here is, oh, yeah, we're, we're scanning and indexing various pages. And then we're going to give you results um, that give diversity in our answers. So there we understand that within home exercise equipment, there's people looking for affordable or to fit it in a small space or whatever. And we're going to give you search results that cover these um, different um, elements or subtopics within the search that you've made. So that to me suggests there's going to be some kind of grouping or clustering um, of different types of content within search results, which is going to 
put some sites off the first page, move some sites up to the first page, make some more prominent, some less prominent, I guess. Um, I'm sure it's not going to affect every search, but clearly um, for a reasonably broad search term, that's, the, that's what they're trying to achieve. So that's probably going to be a fairly big change that we see uh, between now and the end of the year, maybe the start of next. Uh, now, Google have actually been doing something like this for about a year now, but um, they've, they've said that this is something they're going to roll out far more extensively and they've improved the technology around it. Um, it's where you get these key moments um, or almost like chapters in a video um, automatically detected. Uh, so this isn't something that the creator has set up, but it's something Google's algorithm has picked out of the videos. And uh, basically, um, in a search result, you can see there that the different um, key moments, as they call it, and how that's marked out on the timeline. Um, and they reckon that this is going to be used in 10% of searches on Google by the end of the year. Um, so that'd be quite interesting. I'm not sure there's a great deal you can do with that. Um, as a creator, maybe make it fairly obvious in the way that you edit the video together, where one bit starts and the next bit ends or, or something like that in order to get the key moments pulled out, perhaps. But um, quite interesting that... Uh, that they're, they're rolling that out into 10% of searches. Yeah, it's a surprisingly high number. Um, if you are a uh, Android user and uh, you use the Google app, so you can use Google Lens, not all Android devices can, I know, but uh, or get all the updates, but certainly if you've got a Google Pixel, then you will. Um, and you can see several things going on here. This is probably the most confusing slide I could possibly put together. Lots of animation at the same time, breaking all the rules, but hey. Um, so what you see on the left is how um, through, um, OCR and, and uh, text recognition, Google is uh, actually providing a way to solve a quadratic equation that somebody's basically used Google Lens to pick out from some homework they've been given or something, which is uh, fairly clever, I suppose. Um, in the middle of more commercial value to most of us is how Google Lens is able to pick out uh, garments and items from images that you can then immediately go on to shop for. Um, so that's, in a sense, I suppose that's that's really an expansion of technology that Google have been um, putting in place for a couple of years. But, uh, you know, it, it's interesting that they've rolled it out in that way. And then on the right hand side, uh, they're showing how they're kind of doing some augmented reality stuff where um, you can kind of pick out stuff about a car and then change colors. I think you can actually uh, make it appear on your driveway or something like that as well. Um, somewhat limited use for that unless you're an auto manufacturer. But there we go. Clever stuff, nevertheless. Um, so quite a few announcements at, um, at the search on uh, live stream. There are other things in there as well. I'm sure some of you have seen you can now hum your Google search uh, if you want Google to tell you what, it, what song it is that you're humming. Um, so, yeah, clever stuff, but um, not for all of us to use every day, I suppose. Um, in other news around Google, uh, you can no longer request indexing of pages within Search Console for reasons not entirely made clear. Um, they have had some indexing issues um, of one sort or another over the last few weeks. That's been fairly well publicized. They say they're all sorted now. Um, but nevertheless, at the moment, we cannot request a page to be indexed uh, by Google from Search Console, which is potentially a bit frustrating if you need that. Um, and the free shopping listings, as talked about um, over the last few months and launched in the US uh, a few months ago, are now over here. So this month, we've seen these free listings appear. You do have to click through to the Google Shopping tab in a search. You won't see the free uh, shopping listings in a normal um, kind of all results. You'll just get the ads in there. But um, when you click through to shopping, now you will get free listings as well. So that's of interest to you. What you need to look for is uh, Google Merchant Center. And in Google Merchant Center, you need to opt into surfaces across Google. And that's how you get your uh, Merchant Center feed products into these free listing areas. OK, that's enough from me. Uh, suffice to say, we've already, with typical efficiency, scheduled the next drink, which is going to be on the 19th of November. Um, and uh, you can already book yourselves onto that if you want to. On Meetup, that is the link to do so. I'll pop back to that uh, in the near future. But what I'm going to do is stop sharing my screen, hand over to Richard, who, with uh, fantastic uh, efficiency has already tested this. So we know it's going to work when he pushes the button. Hopefully when you push that button, Richard, your slides will appear. Over to you, my friend. Uh, wow, that's quite a build up. That can only mean something can go wrong. Can you see that logo in front of you? Yep. Oh, good. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. And I appreciate that. Um, this is gonna be a slightly different story, I think, in as much as this has been one that has been 
fueled by the digital world, but we have come across quite a few challenges with the digital world in the creation of this story. So I'm going to take about 15, 20 minutes or so, talking you through the story of our year in the creation of this brand, hopefully leaving enough questions for time at the end. Um, and when I say thank you, I do mean thank you for allowing us the time to tell us this story and to talk about this journey, because I'm not sure we'd have taken the time to catalogue this last six months had I not been invited to uh, to talk to you today. Because I think we can all agree 2020 hasn't really been the perfect year, has it? It's probably been not really the year to, you know, embark on a worldwide cruise, to book a holiday, to go to university for the first time or to even start a business. But we did, and this is the story of how and why we did start our business in 2020. New businesses are always obviously really hard to get off the ground, but the unforeseen issues involved with the last six months are hopefully worth 15 minutes of your time this evening. So I don't think anyone really foresaw what was coming this year. Um, certainly not the man in charge anyway. Um, but this is the story of how we created an e-commerce brand which has evolved in the most unexpected circumstances. To give you a bit of context uh, to this story, Trusted PPA is a brand new division of CCM Group, which is our parent company here in Nottinghamshire. Myself and my business partner, we've always thought about setting up an enterprise arm to CCM, which is his existing print media and creative business. And the idea evolved from our slight frustrations that certain brands, businesses, services, processes just didn't work like they should do. We were always a bit bemused by certain things like the fact that there are more business coaches in the UK than there are actually business leaders in the UK. So I'd love to say our ideas were as a result of business planning, of whiteboards, of lots of Mintel insight and research and focus groups, but really this came about from probably far too many conversations in one of Nottingham's very fine pubs about why brand fulfillment and customer service wasn't really important anymore. For us, it became a bit of an obsession. And the concept was that over time, we'd create a series of brands. They served a, a reason to exist, had a very specific role in the marketplace. And we'd spend a year or so creating and devising products and brands, establishing them, and then moving on to the next project, all created by the same team, by the same exceptional customer service, by the strongest marketing and backed by the most substantial market intel. So PPE wasn't really the plan for us. It was a complete accident. It just so happened that PPE as a product was very timely and it actually served as a good opportunity for us to test if we could actually do it. And if we're going back to March, April, May time of this year, PPE just happened to be something that uniquely we were able to source from existing reliable manufacturers in CCM's existing supply chain at a time when nobody else seemingly could. So you might remember that at that time there was demand for certified products and masks, et cetera. And it just so happened we were able to supply and ship to businesses very quickly, most notably to countless care homes and NHS during the, uh, the COVID pandemic at the height of it. And while the raw over PPE supplies to the NHS and care homes continued in the press, our insight was that families, households, and small businesses would soon be requiring not just products, but a bit of advice and support to get their way through this marketplace. But if you ask me why we wanted to get into it, it was one thing, and it was the state of the marketplace, the rogue traders that were out there online selling overpriced, completely uncertified stock. There was ghost stock being shipped, never to arrive, bad actors selling fraudulent items. There were high street retailers selling items at inflated prices. And most of all, the bad advice being given to thousands of panicked customers and consumers via social media advertising. So our business idea was born and we had a purpose and we had a mission. So one Friday back in late April, I drove through very eerie, quiet Nottinghamshire streets up to the office where we thought about creating a brand to bring this mission to life from scratch. And we started at 8.45 in the morning and we said by 9.30, we would name our brand. And we did. We registered the domain and that was trustedppe.co.uk. 
At 10 o'clock, we'd arranged a call with a developer who was going to advise us and who could help us to create the website. By 11 o'clock, he was the man working on it. And he was in R1 of a 48 hour stretch to build the site ready to go live on Monday. And we did it. In the weekend, we created a fully pristine, beautiful, gorgeous website, and we hit the button to go live, except we couldn't. And that's not the first time you'll hear me utter these words in this presentation because the retail platform which we built the site wouldn't accept PPA operators or traders. Rejection was a very recurring theme for us. So after four days building our website, we started work on another one, a mirror image of what we'd spent the entire weekend, day and night creating. But it was during that week that the story was breaking about how the entire UK government shipment of PPE that was being supplied from Turkey was deemed unsuitable for medical purposes. It was a 36 million pound mistake for the government. So the scale of the market confusion was confining even to those supplying to the NHS. But what became stark was the responsibility of the market that we were entering. We weren't just shipping masks in sanitizers. We were fighting our way through offering clarity, help, support and advice in a really tricky marketplace. We knew we couldn't do this by ourselves, so we got through the challenge of how to build a team during a lockdown. And thankfully, having the backing of CCM meant that we have a really good reputation for outstanding talent and a fairly dynamic, innovative attitude to business. But we were asking people to buy into us during a very, very chaotic time. The team were selected due to their enthusiasm, but the challenge of switching between different brands, between different marketplaces. And they were going to be tasked to visually design across a number of different products as we went on to market to entirely different demographics and create a series of different e-commerce sites after PP had died down. And because of the constraints, we interviewed people really differently. We, um, uh, our outstanding HR consultant helped cra craft adverts, which really nailed the attitude of the candidates required for the business. Everybody who applied was encouraged to sell themselves by leaving a voicemail as the starting point, and that's the CCM policy. But on top of that, interviews were conducted at speed by video call. One by one, we employed graphic designer, developers, warehouse packers, customer service team members, social media execs, marketing execs. All in all, over the last six months, CCM has grown from a team of 24 to 50 people. But we had to tell people that we existed so we created an amazing campaign live to go on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Instagram and Google. And we were super excited about it. We hit the button to go live and we couldn't. And that's where we find all the normal roots of taking a new brand to market totally blocked to us, to be absolutely honest. And because of the nervousness of the marketplace that we were entering, it was easier for everyone, specifically the digital platforms, to just say no. There was suspicion, there was skepticism everywhere that we turned, and we struggled. We absolutely struggled. So Google Ads assigned us an account manager when we had real difficulty setting a, a, even a, a basic Google Ad Live. It was blocked countless times. Over time, we went through five different account managers at Google, each of which planned um, a 12-hour solution for us. And not one of those five we ever actually heard from again. Four agencies now have taken on the challenge of trying to get us live on Facebook. And the fourth and final agency we were talking to last week came back to us saying that it was absolutely impossible. After five months, the comms we're trying to promote on the digital channels are absolutely 100% in accordance with all the cu cu current rules um, of advertising masks, sanitizers, PPE during COVID, but we haven't actually been given a single reason as to why we can't advertise or promote through digital channels when others can. So it begged us to face the challenge of how you go about building a brand when digital doesn't really want to know. So we decided to go digital. Uh, sorry, we decided in the absence of going digital that we could only go analog. So we pushed our credentials by doing good old fashioned door drops is a bit of a test to see how our messaging and our tone would land, see if it would cut through. And it worked. We had a great response actually, but all the while we were wondering, imagine what we would be if we could activate digital marketing like normal businesses could do. 
But in the absence of digital, we had to talk to a wider audience. And we started noticing in a lot of digital feeds, as I'm sure a lot of you have done as well, that it became completely clogged up and full of PPE traders and sometimes flighty looking operators selling masks at sometimes four times the prices that we were selling them at. And soon it became apparent that actually, if we were in that space, we might not even get cut through. So we realized we had to work a little bit harder. And I'm a bit of a believer when it comes to marketing that it's hard to be really good contextual modal targeting in advertising. To build trust in a real meaningful collection with our audience, we have to be somewhere credible, somewhere unavoidable and somewhere relevant. And for us, weirdly enough, it ended up at somewhere where the government was spending most of their messaging around coronavirus as well. So it became quite natural for us, and that was going on to radio. So we looked at where the government were advertising, and we decided to follow them, literally, so that when government advertising was going out to millions of people on a daily basis on national radio stations, we would follow them. Only call NHS 111 if you can't get online or your symptoms worsen. Protect yourself. Protect others. Protect the NHS. COVID-19 continues to impact our lives, but with filtering face masks and washable, reusable face coverings from trustedppe.co.uk, you can help protect yourself and others from the virus. Order before 4pm weekdays for same-day dispatch from trustedppe.co.uk. Rated excellent on Trustpilot. And because radio was a low avoidance medium. We were able to kind of cut through under the radar when people were in a more relaxed mood state, when ad avoidance was low. We were also talking to millions of people at a time when people were tuning into the radio to, for news, for advice, but also it was a bit of a background to people while they were setting up you know, home offices and working from home for the first time in years. Interestingly, it made us work a little bit harder to see what digital um, opportunities we could explore with audio. So we were able to explore things like digital streaming services such as TuneIn, Spotify and DAX. And we were able to play city specific copy when relevant. So for example, when cities such as Londonderry or Manchester faced rising and quite severe COVID infection rates, we were able to supply creative, which specifically talked to those listeners and upweighted them Whenever the, uh, whenever the numbers rose. We're currently developing how to stream postcode specific mentioning um, areas. So for example, if you're in Glenfield in Leicester, we can specifically mention Glenfield in a piece of copy while somebody else listening to the exact same message will hear a completely different region. Using Google Play, Amazon Alexa and digital radio, we've discovered all these very interesting things you can do with digital audio in 2020. But where things started to surprise us in this digital e-commerce model that we've created was that we were expected to be quite a one-way relationship. We were fulfilling customers' requests and giving them some advice online. But what we didn't expect was that it was going to be a bit closer than that. It wasn't distanced. It wasn't removed. The customers really became talk came to talk to us directly and they really, really wanted to talk to us as well because we could have employed focus groups and consultants, but instead we had people like Angela from Liverpool and Angela talked with me for about 35 minutes one moment during the uh, lockdown period about how grateful she was to receive her masks, but also about how she didn't really believe in e-commerce and that she didn't really understand PayPal and she didn't really understand Apple Pay and that she wouldn't put her information or details into the website because she didn't really trust the internet and it suddenly that was the penny drop moment for us that we actually needed to have a closer relationship with these customers at a time when the public mood was heightened she loved our service so much that she even asked for a poster uh, of our brand which she actually put in her front room window and sent us photographs to it and so far I think she's responsible for many hundreds of pounds worth of sales in Liverpool for trusted PPE but in our desperate attempt for efficiency it meant that we'd not even created a manned phone number uh, we thought would be entirely e-commerce and we weren't and then the answer machine messages came through and these messages really give you a glimpse into the public moods and in truth, the public created much of the range of stuff that we did. So some customers talked to us about having difficulties with masks that, you know, they struggled with expression, the hard of hearing and communication and following direct requests from schools that were serving deaf pupils or care homes, 
masks made communication really tricky. And so we created things like clear, transparent masks as a result of those direct conversations with customers. One of our best in customers got in touch talking about how fearful she was at going shopping, having been shielding for three months. And she just wanted people to be a bit more considerate and give her a bit more space when she was shopping. So we ended up creating badges specifically for that customer and just badges that showed that she'd appreciate that little bit more space. We created masked exempt badges because customers wanted to know what they could do if they didn't and couldn't wear a mask for medical reasons. We've shipped about 5,000 of those badges so far. And similarly with the public attitude, it was fascinating to see how the public mood, et cetera, reacted to the, uh, the pandemic. There were natural trends, which was to be expected, what we called podium moments, which was the traffic to the website would absolutely fly the second that the podium landed outside Dining Street and um, a big news story was about to be announced. And there were also those moments during the pandemic that told their own story. Our traffic to the website fell by two thirds in the first two weeks of the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, probably because there was this attitude that it was kind of disappearing and starting to go away. And also following, following what happened with uh, the Dominic Cummings Barnard Castle debate, traffic for that week following that story all but disappeared from the site. We thought it was over. We thought it was absolutely game over. But during this period, we've been afforded a real insight into the lives of consumers during an extraordinary period in our history. The manned web chat that we have had has seen unbelievable conversations, including some pretty eye-watering comments from anti-maskers, from COVID deniers, or from those who just wanted to vent some slightly odd racist conspiracy theories. And you see the patience and the impatience of customers at a time like this. And that's been a real lesson for us. In this marketplace, you realize that if it's setting up a new business, especially in this market, the customer's first action is suspicion and distrust. And this is an example of a, a, a very sincere message that we sent out to a customer explaining that there was a delay to this customer's masks due to the, the, the uh, supply um, issue. And the customer responded back by suggesting that it was written by a bot, a digital system, an automated response explaining that uh, I'm sure that James Clifford neither sent the email nor is he reading this email. He did not draft the email either. Whereupon Jamie, who did craft the email, went straight back and um, connected with the customer again, only for the customer to be slightly surprised that we were real people doing a real job in a warehouse in Nottinghamshire doing this for the public good. But the timing has been incredible and it's something we'll never really forget. The business world has been in hibernation and specifically with advice, support, infrastructure, we've really struggled. Week after week, we reached out for explanations as to why we struggled with our digital output, why we couldn't get it to go live and we were struggling to get any human being to talk to us. At one point, our shopping platform, we used Shopify, withheld every penny of our customers' money from us while they reviewed all certifications of everything we were selling on our website. That lasted for five weeks. And after sending all the certificates to them to be reviewed, we received a very short thank you carry on email from a very unnamed Shopify email account. So has it worked? How have we actually survived? And why are we sitting here today telling you this story? To conclude, today marks 175 days since we actually started this brand. And can you launch a brand without any real substantial digital marketing support? I think the answer is yes, but you have to work quite hard on it. Today marks the 175 days, but we've shipped over 20 million items of PPE across the UK in those 175 days. We've got 30,000 customers now and a returning customer rate, which is currently somewhere over 35%. Over 10% people who visit the site purchase, which we're pretty proud of. We're thankfully rated excellent on Trustpilot, which isn't particularly easy to do in this marketplace. And as of this week, we are now um, in several high street retailers who've reached out to us to want to stock our products. But what are the shareable lessons about all this? What have we learned? Well, we've been afforded a real insight into the lives of our customers during this extraordinary period in our history. The man's web chat has seen just absolutely unbelievable stories, but also some really heartwarming insights into the public. 
but we've strayed, stayed absolutely true to the vision that we set out back in April, the underlying true belief that what you're trying to create, and if you do it right, extraordinary stories can emerge in the most difficult times. We set out to create a pure e-commerce digital business as automated as possible, but in the end, it was the two-way relationship with the customers, their experience, their thoughts, their fears, their advice and their direction that shaped this journey that we've been on. So where do we face the future now? What does it look like going forward? Well, for us, we've very much tried not to demonize the mask. We know that this virus is one that we're gonna to have to live with. So we've developed things like Halloween variants and we're about to launch a brand new Christmas line along with a partnership with a national UK charity. We're going to donate all proceeds from an exclusive range of um, uh, Christmas cards to help those dealing with loneliness this winter, firmly embedding the brand essence of this, you know, this, 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 this brand outlet, support, relatability and compassion. We think it's gonna be quite a tricky winter for a lot of people. And that's why we are really reaching out to them. And we're even doing things like a wellness advent calendar as part of our website, just to really appreciate what people are going through. And that has come from the direct two-way relationship and the conversations we've been having with our customers. And what's interesting is that despite the digital platform, we've probably been able to gain quite a lot of um, traction, more attention than we thought possible. We felt quite touched by the plight of the students who were returning to uni and we instinctively decided to send like care packages, 500 boxes full of treats, mindfulness exercises, masks, pizza vouchers, etc. And interestingly, the press, the press really picked up on it. We've been interviewed by ITV and BBC News. So we find ourselves pushed into spaces that we never really thought possible. And in truth, we've been waiting for the window to launch our next brand and we're really excited about it. And we can't wait to reveal where we're going next because we thought we'd be done now with PPA. We thought COVID would be gone. We hoped we'd have seen this pandemic off and we'd be back to some kind of normal and we'd be able to share stories like what I'm telling you now face to face in a room rather than via screen, but sadly it's not been the case. I think businesses will have to live with this pandemic for years to come and the repercussions of it will stay with us for a long time to come. And many of the harshest lessons we might not have even learned yet, but wherever we go next, the lesson is that in adverse adversity, it's fascinating to see how you can be energized by a no, how you can be spurred on by rejection and driven by the power of a proper two-way relationship with the consumer. And here's just a few of the people that we've spoken to over the last few months. I'm very old and I don't use the internet. I really do need them, otherwise I'm not going to be able to get out of my house. Just, um, I'm not a key worker, but um, I've just had a message come up on my phone for my surgery for uh, needing to wear oh, a mask. Good morning, darling. Um, I don't use the net. I haven't got a computer or anything. I would appreciate oh, hello, you um, I can't, I'm not on internet, so I can't use your, your web. And I'd like to place an order for some, for some masks and some sam, hand sanitizer, please. So if you could call um, me back, you Mr. Can. Johnson has mentioned now that everybody's going to be starting back uh, to work and going uh, to work as normal. There's not a single person that left a message for us that we didn't call back and speak to. And if we had tunnel vision, I wouldn't be presenting to you this evening because this pandemic has thrown everything absolutely upside down. Our successes has, have come from the no's, from the challenges, from the inability to use digital to its full potential, and from having these really close relationships with our incredible customers, customers as we have worked through and built this business during what has been an absolutely extraordinary time. Thank you. Many thanks, Richard. That's a really, really interesting story. I think it's fair to call your business high growth. Uh, and uh, I'm sure a few people watching this share your frustrations with various uh, faceless giant technology platforms, causing you all manner of grief for an untold amount of time with no justification whatsoever. Um, that's a fairly common experience amongst us. And um, I feel for those people and the agencies that were trying to get that working for you. Um, so thank you very much for your uh, your insight and that story. I, I think that's uh, very inspiring. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Luke, who I trust is also suitably well prepared with his screen sharing. Uh, 
it's all gone very dark behind you now, Luke. That's yeah. Pressing. I think I think we had a, a question for for Richard come through in the Q and A as well. Just oh, ah, ah, so we've got Q and A as well as the chat. There we go. Okay, can you see the Q and A, uh, Richard? If you click it on your Zoom controls, I will do that. Just one second. Here we go. Yes. Which advertising channel do you wish you could have broken through, which you believe would have brought you even more success? Um, I think where we wanted to try to take the brand would prob probably have been Facebook. I think we wanted to try to talk to that over 50s audience, and I think they were big Facebook users over the last six months. Um, I think the difficulty would have been how we would have communicated in a way that was different to a lot of other players in the marketplace because there was so much clutter and so much noise and so much confusion and misinformation around PPE that I, I, I don't quite know how we would have got that right. We would have had to work very hard on it. But I think from my point of view, the frustration was kind of what could have been possible? What could we have done? How much easier would it have been? Would it have been easier? I'm not quite sure. I think we wouldn't have ended up in the place we're in today, having reached a mass broadcast audience the way that we have done. But I think we'd be in a very, very different place and be talking to very different consumers if we'd used Facebook. And part of me thinks at some point we will be able to activate it. We will be able to switch it on. So it'll be curious to see what Facebook can actually do for us. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Luke, if you'd like to push the necessary buttons to share your screen. Yeah, hopefully this works properly. <laughs> Should have tested it before. Cool. Can everyone see my screen now then? Can indeed, yeah. Let's see what Great. happens if you click that. Cool. Yeah, all looks good. Okay, I'll shut up. Over to you, Luke. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, so today we're going to talk about structuring YouTube campaigns for success, but just quickly beforehand, a little bit about me. Um, so I work at Impression, paid media executive at Impression, um, which I'm sure most of you know is a digital marketing agency in Nottingham. Um, that's the big town square you can see behind me. Um, I've been at Impression nearly two years now, so I started um, in February 2019, um, but I have a little bit of PPC experience from before that as well, um, uh, from a uh, kind of more broad marketing role at a startup in Nottingham. Um, this is my first time doing Drink Digital, although I've done a couple other uh, sort of little talks before as well. Um, but I'm pretty gutted not to be kind of making use of the free pizza and the, the pints at Canal House. Um, but I guess it is what it is. So moving on to YouTube. Um, I guess as an agency, we've been starting to experiment with this a lot more recently. Um, and I think the, the kind of key drivers behind this is because we can um, see that it offers a lot of growth for a lot of our clients, um, particularly some of the ones we've been getting this year. <clears throat> and I guess some of the, the kind of stats behind that are that um, YouTube has over 2 billion logged in users worldwide. Um, so this is like people through their, their phone app or on their browser. Uh, in addition to that, there's over a billion hours of video watched every single day. Um, and 60% of users watching content on YouTube uh, claim that they're watching content they're passionate about. Um, and I can confirm that only 10% of that is me watching this video on repeat. Um, but seriously, 30% uh, of shoppers um, watch video content of products that they will later go on to purchase. And um, we were recently kind of told this by, by someone at Google, um, but we were kind of thinking why is the channel still so undervalued despite this? Like that's a huge number of people engaging um, with like video content and then going on to make like a direct purchase. It's not just kind of informational. There is actually purchase intent there. Um, and I guess what we were kind of thinking is, is why? Like why um, do we as an agency, I guess, even still, um, you know, have such a, a limited presence with YouTube compared to say display or social and we think that the, the kind of key reason behind this was um, confusion and people aren't really sure where to start with, with YouTube. Um, it operates quite differently to a search campaign um, through Google Ads. And so I guess someone setting up um, a YouTube campaign, you know, they might ask themselves, like, where do I start? What creative do I need? Um, I can't actually see. <laughs> I've got a thing in there. How should I bid? Um, Oh, my PowerPoint's gone. What, audience should, what audiences should I target? Uh, what ad format do I need? And how did I get here? 
Um, but basically, we're hopefully going to answer all of those um, questions today. So we're going to talk about how to structure, measure, and measure your YouTube campaigns to maximize their effectiveness. So what I could do here is basically just leave this on screen for 15 minutes and relax and let you read it and take it in. But uh, that's pretty much too easy. So <laughs> what we're going to do is break it out into three kind of campaign tiers. Um, I'm sure everyone recognizes this, this kind of funnel approach and everyone that works at Impression um, has probably seen it about a thousand times in pitch decks. But basically, we're going to kind of think about approaching YouTube campaigns in terms of um, three different tiers. So we're going to have reach and awareness, which is, I guess, a brand building kind of thing. Um, consideration and interest, which is trying to get more people to start engaging with your brand. Um, and then action, which is obviously getting people to convert through the website or through the phone, however the case may be. Um, so for each one of these, starting with reach and awareness, what I'm going to do is kind of try and answer some of those questions, which I just mentioned. So um, we'll talk about what kind of ad types you need to use, what audience targeting you should be going for, um, how you should sort of set KPIs and measure things, um, and how you should approach your bidding as well. So jumping right into reach and awareness, um, the ad type that you're um, primarily going to want to use with these will be non-skippable ad formats. Um, so that can be six second bumper ads or 15 second non-skippable in-stream ads. Um, the reason that we want to use this is, is basically if you give a totally cold user that you'd be targeting in this kind of reach campaign, the option to skip, they're, they're definitely going to skip. Um, Basically, you want to literally force the user to watch the ad. Um, I suppose you could argue that um, like ads that you can't skip are kind of annoying or you know, it gives you a negative opinion of the brand. But I think realistically, um, you're never going to be able to kind of convince all of the people that you're reaching with such a broad campaign that you know, you're the kind of brand that they want to engage with. But critically you are getting in their head and there will always be a portion of people who remember you because they've seen these ads and aren't annoyed by the six second like bumper ad that you can't skip um, and they you know they are kind of more likely to move further down the funnel so at this point you want to use this kind of ad, ad type because it is literally just about forcing people to be aware that you exist not even educating them or trying to get them to do anything it's just about telling people that you're there and you know, six seconds is perfect to do that. Um, you know, you can actually pull up some figures in, in Google Ads about um, you know the, the engagement with these kinds of ads. So there's a, a metric called video played to, um, and what this kind of shows is how far users get through um, your ad video uh, and like the percentage of users that get to that stage. So you can see that some users, when they're presented with a non-skiffle ad, they do actually just close the window straight away or close the tab straight away. Um, they don't even make it a quarter of the way through the video. And so I guess in this example that we had, which we ran for a client, um, it was sort of getting on for 10% of those people. Um, however, when it kind of progressed further through the non-skippable video, the drop off was, was much less. So by the end of the ad, um, you know, over 85% of users were still kind of watching the video and they proceeded to, to watch the rest of the video afterwards. Um, so it does kind of show you that just putting it in, forcing someone to watch it doesn't necessarily make them uh, so annoyed by it that they're just going to turn the video off in, in the vast majority of cases. Um, so moving on to audiences with these kind of campaigns, uh, there's kind of a couple of options here for sort of a, such a broad, um, you know, awareness campaign. And these are detailed demographics and uh, affinity slash custom affinity audiences. So, you know, detailed demographics are things like, um, you know, parental status, homeowner status, that kind of thing. Um, it's like bits of information about people's life that is more specific than just gender or age. Um, and then affinity and custom affinity audiences and what we've kind of, the approach that we've taken with these in the, in the past the impression is, um, especially for custom affinity, um, pulling out like a, a big detailed list of competitors for the particular business that we're um, you know, running the campaign for. 
and then just inputting all of their um, websites into a custom affinity audience. Um, essentially, like what Google is going to do here is then like match those up to people who are like vaguely interested in the same kind of service that uh, the business is offering. And as such, they're good to target to alert, like give them awareness of your brand, but they haven't necessarily shown any like more specific engage engagement with um, that kind of business to justify putting affinity audiences into like the next stage of the funnel. Um, you know, we want to be showing these kinds of ads to people who probably haven't heard of you um, and we're going to be forcing them to watch the ad because of the ad type that we're using. So, um, you know, we don't want to be using that for like further down the funnel kind of audiences of people who might be a bit more engaged. Um, I think I've seen a couple little questions pop up, so I can't, um, I might come to those at the end, so that might be a little bit easier. But yeah, yeah, okay, I'll just carry on for now. Um, so yeah, just moving on to bidding for the reach campaigns. You basically realistically only have one sensible option here, which is um, target CPM. What you're doing um, with target CPM is basically like targeting a certain cost point for a thousand impressions. So in the, the example we've got here, um, I think we had a, a five pound target CPM. So a thousand impressions was, uh, Google was aiming to spend five pounds per thousand impressions. Um, the reason that we will use this kind of bidding strategy for such a high, high up in the funnel campaign is because um, these campaigns are almost never going to convert. So the KPI isn't a conversion and it's not, you know, anything even really more than an impression or, or reach or frequency or that kind of thing. You might not even get clicks really with, with this sort of campaign because it really is just putting your ad in front of someone they're just gonna like probably watch it, not engage with it at all, and then go to the video. But it's just getting in their head. So you know, out of um, over a hundred thousand impressions with this, these two kind of non-skippable campaigns we had, we had only fifty-five clicks and not a single conversion. Um, so setting these kind of impression and, and reach KPIs um, are really important for these kind of uh, top of the funnel campaigns. And you don't want to get caught up in, in chasing conversions. And that's why you want to use this kind of really high level um, target CPM bidding strategy. So moving down the funnel onto this kind of consideration and interest campaign. Um, the aim of these campaigns is, you know, it's kind of what does what it says on the tin. Like um, you're trying to get users to engage with your brand a bit more, but not necessarily to take action at this point. So the ad type that you're going to use for these um, is skippable in-stream ads. Uh, you know, the aim of this, these campaigns is not to like piss people off. You just wanna be driving a bit of interest using the slightly longer ad format that in-stream ads offer. Um, so you can have these up to a few minutes if you want, but um, they'll always be skippable after five seconds. Um, we would usually advise clients to kind of have a, a 15 to 30 second ad format where you can provide a bit more information about what you're offering to um, engage those users who are a bit more interested. But if they're not, then they still have the option to skip. And kind of critically, um, the users that don't then skip, you know are the ones that are kind of more engaged and more likely to um, move on to the next stage of the funnel. I can see more alerts coming in for questions, I think, but um, I'll just come to them at the end. Um, so audiences for consideration campaigns, it's kind of what you would expect. So um, in market segments, which is audiences that Google um, have identified where people have shown a particular kind of purchase interest or um, you know, engagement interest for specific topics um, and kind of business categories, I suppose. Um, they kind of match up perfectly with this kind of campaign. So it's people who are likely to take action in a certain industry or likely to kind of click through to a website, um, you can layer those in with your audiences here. Um, but something else that I don't know you might be kind of less common is something like live events, which um, you know isn't relevant for every business. So an example that we have for this is uh, the kind of example that I've used a couple of times now was actually a car insurance company for younger drivers. 
Um, and one of the life event uh, attributes that Google lets you target is um, people who've just graduated from university. Um, so through uh, targeting like that really specific age range and people who you know might be getting a car as a gift for like graduating or something like that, um, people luckier than me, I guess. But um, you can really like nail in uh, or home in rather on that specific kind of audience. Um, and I guess the, the final option here that you might not consider is um, similar audiences. So, you know, these will be, could be completely cold users that, um, you know, haven't engaged at all with your brand before, but they're just matched up by Google to be really similar to users who have purchased through you or have shown like really strong engagement on your website. And what this does is just kind of broadens the number of new users you can reach a bit further up the funnel, but um, you know, who are likely to have a high, higher level of engagement. It doesn't necessarily mean that they've demonstrated that they're going to, but they're just more likely to because they you know, show certain similarities. So like all, the, all of these three um, audiences do really match up quite well with the kind of campaign you're running here and the kind of ads that you're gonna be showing. Um, and finally, for consideration and interest, uh, you kind of have a couple options with bidding. So you could just go for the same um, target CPM strategy, uh, but depending on the kind of volume of data that you get through the campaign in terms of interactions, so that can be views or clicks, um, you know, clicks through to the website or views which are, um, you know, watching over a certain percentage of a skippable ad. Uh, if you get lots of engagements like that, then you might choose to start using a target CPV strategy um, because that will kind of help the machine learning algorithm understand which kinds of users are more likely to, you know, watch a certain percentage of video or click through to the website. And as a result, help to build that kind of level of engagement. Um, but you do have to be quite mindful of the amount of data that you have here um, because it will always work better if you have more data. So you're, if you're on kind of a lower budget, then it's, you know, it's maybe more sensible to use target CPM. So moving on to action campaigns, um, you know, this is kind of the same sort of ad type as we have uh, with um, the consideration and interest campaign um, in that you can still, you're still likely to use kind of skippable ads because if these users are already engaged with your brand, you don't necessarily need to like force them to do something. You can just keep putting in front of them as, as a bit of a reminder. Um, but another option here that you might want to layer in a bit more um, at this stage of the funnel is true view for, for action um, ad types, which is basically the same as a skippable in-stream ad, um, except you get this quite prominent CTA as well. Um, so I'm sure like everyone's been bombarded with the Grammarly ads at some point, um, particularly over kind of the work from home period that seems to happen as well. Um, but yeah, you do get this little banner across the bottom of the ads with, you know, like it's free in a big, um, kind of eye-catching button. So seeing as the purpose of these action campaigns is to drive users to complete a goal, um, it's much more appropriate to use these kind of ad types which are actually encouraging people to, to do something rather than just trying to put your brand kind of in, in front of them or tell them a bit more about what you have to offer. Um, in terms of audiences here, it's for the most part what you would expect. Um, so remarketing and customer match audiences, you know, people who've already shown, like they've demonstrated engagement with your brand and they just need help to get over the line. Um, I think everyone would kind of know to do that already. But uh, customer intent audiences seem like a bit of a curveball here in that you wouldn't necessarily think, okay, well, cu like customer intent is just assuming a user's intent to do something based on keywords um, or, you know, search terms. So. The example that we've got here, which is um, for the same car insurance company of the custom intent audience we created for them was basically just a, a list of like the top few hundred search terms. Like, it does go on a lot further down than this. You can only see a, a small amount of it. Um, just take a look at like the top few hundred search terms, put it into um, this kind of people who match purchase intentions with these search terms um, in the audience builder 
and then apply this to the kind of remarketing campaign. Um, we were kind of, we heard about this from one of our Google account managers um, as a technique and they were saying that they'd seen good results with, it, with other agencies and such. And we were pretty skept skeptical about it to begin with because, you know, custom intent, you wouldn't imagine that it would work as well as remarketing for this kind of thing. But we were actually really surprised with the results that we got. So in July, um, you can see towards the end of the month, this is for all video campaigns as well, not just the remarketing campaigns. Um, upon the inclusion of uh, custom intent audiences within our kind of bottom of the funnel action campaign, um, we saw a massive spike in conversion volume across all video campaigns um, and a really significant and stable drop in CPA as well. So we're going from, you know, between one and four conversions per day um, up to 40 at one point. And it really was like an overnight change. So despite it not necessarily being the obvious thing to do, um, it did actually really improve results for this client in particular. So the lesson here is like sometimes Google account managers do actually have valuable things to say. They're not just trying to give you a sales pitch on smart bidding. Um, so yeah, it is a really valuable tip to take away um, and probably one of the most kind of interesting and, and unexpected things we've learned with with structuring and setting up YouTube campaigns so far. Um, and then finally, uh, bidding with these kind of action campaigns. Um, you have a couple of options again, but uh, it is quite limited to kind of conversion based ones. So um, really it depends on volume again. So if you have a, a lot of conversion volume, um, you probably want to go for kind of, no, sorry. If you don't have much conversion volume, you probably want to go for kind of a maximized conversion strategy. Um, whereas if you have much more conversion volume and you're kind of looking to reduce the CPA at which you're achieving those um, and just like incrementally increase the amount by doing so, then target CPA might be more appropriate. Uh, realistically, you need quite a lot of volume to make either of them work. Um, but hopefully if you're running this kind of full funnel YouTube campaign alongside other stuff, then you do start, get, start to get that volume. Um, so kind of moving on to measurement, I've kind of touched on this a couple of times, but measuring, uh, the results of YouTube campaigns is, is quite different to a standard search campaign. So you're not necessarily just looking for conversions. Um, and it's not, you, you know, it'd be wrong to, um, pause, uh, reach or awareness campaign because it's not driving any conversions. So you know, what do you look for instead as a, a good measure of success? And I mentioned kind of impressions and, and reach and that kind of thing. But, you know, there's a few more things that you can do to try and um, evaluate the impact of these, these YouTube campaigns on the bottom line. Um, and the first one of these is kind of an obvious one, I guess, is view through conversions, which is a metric available in Google Ads, um, which kind of counts when a user saw a YouTube ad and didn't interact with it. So, you know, they could have just skipped it, um, but then later converted through another channel. Um, realistically, all of your YouTube campaigns will get um, like many more of these than, than regular conversions. Um, and especially in kind of the remarketing campaigns, you, you should probably expect an awful lot of U3 conversions compared to regular ones. Oh, the light's just gone off in the room, hold on. <laughs> back um, so where was i yeah you probably expect way more of these in your remarketing campaigns um i guess primarily because if someone if a user has already been engaged with your ad um and they see it again on youtube you know it's probably not the, the kind of time that they're uh ex expected to convert it's just keeping you refreshed in their mind and then they'll be like you know they'll come back to the website later and convert um so view through conversions is like a really important metric to monitor. Um, it's worth mentioning, I think, that to track these, you can't just use imported Google Analytics goals. You have to set up a, a Google Ads um, conversion tracking tag as well, um, like a native Google Ads tracking thing. Um, so in order to do that, you have to kind of set that up um, beforehand, but it's really valuable for kind of judging um, the wider impact of YouTube campaigns. Um, in a similar sense, for getting kind of uh, the bigger picture of what's happening um, with your campaigns, 
Uh, you can look at the top conversions path report in Google Analytics. Um, what this kind of lets you see is like the actual stages in the, the user journey um, on the way to a conversion. And you can kind of identify where video campaigns do sit within that journey. Um, this is actually a lot more useful if you set up your channel grouping properly. Um, so in this case, I've actually had to go into the conversion paths report, but then restrict it to Google Ads, which is why um, there's a lot of these kind of unavailable ones. If you've set up your channel grouping properly to have anything with a camp, you know, campaign name of, of video um, to then uh, like be shown as video in your default um, campaign grouping, you'll be able to see it within um, you know, where it sits next to organic search or paid search or social. And you can try and get like a broader picture of the, the whole kind of conversion journey um, and where like video is kind of responsible for conversions there. And then finally, and, and probably most interestingly, um, organic search lift is, is something that we've been looking at um, to try and identify the overall value um, of kind of YouTube campaigns like outside of paid entirely. So what this, this graph is, um, is for the car insurance client again. And um, essentially this is the like source medium uh, report in Google Analytics filtered to just um, organic search. Um, and then we're looking at a graph of new users from, I think this is from about March until like today. Um, and obviously it's, you can't sort of look at the first couple months of it um, and say like it's statistically significant for obvious reasons. But what you can see is the period when we've had um, YouTube activity running uh, for this client, there was a notable um, increase in new users through organic search when we first enabled the campaigns and then a noticeable drop off when we paused them as well. So what this is kind of uh, suggesting, not necessarily proving, but suggesting is that by having um, this kind of top of the line uh, YouTube activity running, which involves like reach campaigns that are just like putting your name out there, you then will start to experience like a organic search lift. And um, this was like probably predominantly branded searches, which can be from the, the kind of um, reach campaigns, but it could also be non-branded as well. People kind of searching around the, the topic, but that could also have come um, you know, been put into their heads as a result of the ad as well. Um, so this is kind of a metric that we're looking to uh, do a bit more digging with and try and um, get a bit more detailed with how we can measure it. But looking into this kind of organic report for new users it is um, seemingly quite a good way of doing it at this point. Um, there are a couple other things that you can do if you have a really high advertising budget. Um, such as having like brand lift surveys with your ads as well. But um, you basically have to be spending about $20,000 a month to be able to do that just on YouTube. So realistically, this is about as close as you'll be able to get to understanding that kind of um, brand recall and, and brand lift um, that you get from YouTube ads. And then the final section is just basically disclaimers because uh, I understand that there's a lot of things in this talk that probably, you know, wouldn't apply to every every business and, and doesn't work for everyone. Um, so we'll just go through a few of those quickly. Um, and I'd say this is probably the most important one, which is creative is incredibly important. So if you don't have like good creative that is tailored to the kind of audience that um, you're trying to reach, it doesn't matter how good your campaign setup is, you're still going to be fucked. Um, because if you're not targeting the right users with the right message, uh, they're just not gonna be engaged no matter how good your like campaign setup and, and all your bidding strategies are. Um, I suppose the only advice I can offer with this if your agency side is trying to educate the client on you know what works best with video ads and, and best practices. Um, but I'm not necessarily saying you're likely to get any, um, I guess, kind of response from that. <laughs> um, Another thing uh, is don't expect immediate results. So half the reason you're probably uh, running YouTube ads in the first place is to kind of build awareness and drive interest. Um, expecting that to then convert to like actual conversions straight away is, is pretty unrealistic. Um, 
you might get some some like immediate results with your kind of action campaign, but YouTube definitely works better as part of this like multi-channel um, long-term strategy with like all you know paid search and social and display alongside it um, as as kind of a strategy to drive gradual growth. Um, and I realized as I was writing the slide that um, I actually am starting to sound a lot like an SEO now. Um, and finally, this, this is pretty important, kind of ties everything else together. Um, trying YouTube ads with a small budget is, is like just almost always going to be a bad idea. Um, YouTube is kind of inherently pretty costly because you're not in the case of like reach campaigns or consideration campaigns looking to get conversions necessarily. Um, so, you know, if a smaller business was looking at their, their remaining marketing budget for the month and they're like, oh, we've got a few hundred quid to use on YouTube. Um, we're having a bit of slow month, a bit of a slow month. Let's like, try and get some more results from this. Um, YouTube is, is not what you want to um, spend that money on. It's, it's never going to rescue you in a tricky month. Um, it, it's basically, it's much more uh, well-placed to help you um, achieve longer term growth as part of this kind of multi-channel strategy that I mentioned before. Um, so for, for that reason, kind of, it does require much more of a full funnel approach and much more dedicated resource to it. It's not, it's not for ad hoc advertising really. And that is pretty much it. Um, so I think I saw some questions come through. So I think if I like try and stop sharing my screen, um, oh, I could have done this the whole time, couldn't I? Um, cool. So. Uh, what size budget would you need to start with? I think um, that really does depend on like the business, to be honest. Um, it, it does completely depend. I wouldn't say there's like a fixed amount that you need to have to um, be able to run a successful campaign. I think it's more about um, sitting down and like deciding exactly what you're going to spend on like your reach campaign and your consideration campaign and having like dedicated resource um, rather than just using it as like an ad hoc thing that you spend the, the rest of your marketing budget that you haven't spent so far this month. Um, it really would change in terms of like an actual number or like completely depending on the business. So um, hopefully that answers your question to some extent. Many uh, thanks, Luke. Uh, Really appreciate that, and uh, yeah, good insight there. I'm interested in the um, uh, some of the things you've seen in there, and uh, yeah, the, the bump in or drop in organic traffic, depending on whether the videos are or not. It's quite an interesting one for me as well. So, uh, hopefully, we've got some things there. We've got another question coming here from um, from Nathan. Uh, it's uh, one for you again, Luke. If you can read that, mm -hmm. you go for that one, Matty. Um, yeah, sure. So the question is, what is an appropriate time frame and budget for each stage? Um, and the example is safety training company advertising courses locally on a county level. So I guess appropriate time frame and budget. Um, interestingly, what we kind of saw with this, the, the biggest kind of campaign that we've done in terms of YouTube is that the majority of the cost does actually go to the kind of action campaign, like remarketing campaign. Um, in that case, it was almost certainly because the client's kind of quite well established and their brand's out there already. But in terms of uh, volumes of impressions, the reach campaign did have like significantly more. So the, the budget isn't necessarily like, it doesn't necessarily go where you would expect it to in terms of volume. So, you know, the uh, campaign that like in the top tier um, might have like millions of impressions, but it, because you're paying on like a target CPM basis, you might actually pay significantly less for that like huge volume of impressions. So I'd say um, you'd have to kind of, ultimately you do want to spend more in, in areas where people are gonna convert. So what I'm in a roundabout way saying is don't underestimate how much budget you'll need for the remarketing or the action sort of campaign, especially with the inclusion of custom intent as an audience in there because it does like open it out a little bit too. Um, in terms of time frame, I think it's like, it's definitely worth running all of these at the same time. So um, 
all of these different kinds of users that you're targeting are kind of always present. Like there's always going to be users to remarket to who haven't made a purchase on your website yet or converted. There's always going to be some who haven't engaged with you yet, um, but are like demonstrating interest in similar areas. And there's always going to be people who are totally unaware of you. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that this is something you should do sequentially. I would suggest that it's probably um, a long-term thing that you have dedicated resource for. Lovely. Thanks, Nick. Um, Leah's asking here, um, do we have a recording of last month's webinar? Not as far as I'm aware, I'm afraid, Leah. Um, so uh, if we have, we'll dig it out. Um, we were just chatting about that beforehand, actually. But um, as far as I'm aware, we don't, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, we'll certainly let everybody know if we do. Um, one of your uh, impression compatriots got a question for you here, Luke. Yep. Um... And the question is, so how do you convince a wary client to give YouTube a go? Um, I would say if you have like previous data to hand, like we, um, the example I gave with the, the kind of organic brand lift, um, if that doesn't, you know, give someone, uh, what's the word? If that doesn't suggest to someone that there is definitely some value in, in running YouTube, then I would say like, I don't know what would. Um, it is like a really stark start and end point with like a noticeable increase in new users coming through organic traffic um with kind of less budget required than a paid search campaign so i think that would be probably the best thing that you can give to someone if possible um but kind of outside of that if you don't have any past examples of it um i think some of the kind of stats at the start that i mentioned um and the growth in those as well so the number of users who are engaging with content um, that they're passionate about and then would like later um, down the funnel, like go and actually buy that product. Um, those figures, you know, I haven't gotten to hand, but uh, the one that I mentioned that one of our like Google account managers had told us about, it's the, the growth of that year on year um, in terms of like how many people are watching video content before then going on to buy that product or a similar product. Um, is, is like massively increasing every year. Excellent, lovely. Thanks, Luke. Okay, if we don't have uh, any other questions, I will pop back up my final slide here. So you've all got the link there and the date for the next drink. Thanks all for your attention this evening, especially thank you to Richard and Luke for taking the time to put those presentations together and come along tonight and speak to us all. Uh, it's much appreciated. And uh, for the rest of you, hopefully we'll see you at the next drink on the 19th of November. Thank you.